So uh, I have the first question. Uh, Mr. Shanks, I get asked this quite often. Where are you? May uh, we see who's uh, It's right here, Mr. Shanks. Yes, yes. Uh, who, who's a better kisser, Claudia Black or Ben Browder? <laughs> a girl doesn't kiss and tell, but it's Ben Browder. Okay, just, just because I don't think I've ever been on stage with these guys. Do we have any Farscape fans in the audience? Okay, just for them, because they need to experience this, and because my son asked me to do this from America, direct it this way. Can I get a hell yeah? Hell yeah! Nice. Ben Browder, powered by Coca-Cola. <laughs> and jet lag. <laughs> this performance brought to you by New Zealand Airlines, <laughs> where you can stop three times for a 30-hour trip <laughs> to <laughs> Perth. <laughs> it's not that the world doesn't love you. It's just you're a long way away. <laughs> no, it's great to be here. Awesome. So are we... Are we are we performing or taking questions? No, 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 we're taking questions. We're going to talk about ourselves for an hour. First question, let's go. Cliff, of all the many bald deaths have you ever had, what was oh, the bald most... Bald deaths? Bald deaths. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I, sorry, I, I, just, I, I haven't heard that one before, but that's great. What was the most fun to do? Do you mean on the show or off? It can be either. Uh, you know what? I enjoyed them all. I loved them all. Yeah. Actually, you know which one was cool? I loved it when this guy shot me right here on the forehead in Continuum. Because that was just pretty cool. But actually, one of the best ones was, I don't remember the episode name, but I had Adria in, in prison in the cage. And I just got riddled with, I don't know, I, had, I think I had like 20 shots on me going in the front, coming out the back. And actually, the force of the explosions was moving my body around, and that was pretty cool. I, I just, I didn't even have to do anything. I just stood there, and I let, let them do it for me. <laughs> that was a good ball death. <laughs> but I am 52, so, I, yeah, I kind of have ball death. Wow, 52, Excuse that's, me, that's kids. old, man. <laughs> Friggin' old. That's what an old man, 52. Woo! I'm 52. <laughs> Hi, guys. I hope you've had a good day. This one's for Fantastic. Michael. Did you actually know that there is an archaeologist whose name's Michael Shanks? Uh, yes, actually, I do. Uh, uh, strangely enough, a few years ago, we were both optioned to do a sort of Discovery Channel, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, series that we were going to do. It was called, uh, it was going to call, be called Digging in the Dirt. And it was basically about... Um, it's Wait, true. So you were going to be talking about Chris Judge. <laughs> <laughs> and he was going to talk I'm about theology. Uh, digging through somebody else's trash, you mean that, that one? Um, no, we were, we were optioned to do... Uh, we had done this um, sizzle reel for this um, s series called Digging in the Dirt, which is about basically um, uh, investigating commonly held archaeological misconceptions throughout the world. Um, and I think the thing that held it up mostly was we knew that every country we were going to go to, we were probably going to get arrested for doing what we were doing, so it kind of held it up. But yes, we were, it, he was actually going to be part of the show, and one of the things that was going to happen was at the start of every expedition, I was going to go to him, he was going to give the background of what was the commonly held archaeological belief, the counter thing of what we were actually looking for, and then myself and a group of others would go out and actually uncover the mystery. And then we realized, with the first one being an, an expedition to Israel, and we were going to debunk some of their commonly held theories um, that we realized that the government was probably going to have us locked up and behind bars every episode. So, I'm sticking with the Chris Judge thing where you would get arrested every country you went Just going country. through his trash. Look, there's another condom. Look, there's another condom. A scotch bottle and another condom. <laughs> Next question. Hello. Excuse the voice. I'm sorry. Wow, um, that is hot. That is hot. 
another Jesus. ball of death coming. You're welcome. You're welcome. I could, I've yeah. got a phone career coming in front of me now. Oh, sorry. Um, welcome to Perth. Uh, I was wondering with all the shows that you did, how much of that was CGI and how much of that was live action? And which was hardest for you to, as actors to, to do? Uh, who was the question for? for all all oh, I think it's for all of us. How, how much of the... the, the uh, how much was live action? How much was CG? Which was more difficult to do? <laughs> well, Chris... <laughs> yeah. Well, in my first ball death... Um, <laughs> that was that prison movie, right? Um, uh... uh well, we were only responsible for the live action part. I mean, acting with CG is sometimes a little tricky, especially when you don't know what's going to be there because that's put in afterwards. So sometimes it can be a little tricky when you imagine in your head, oh, the ship's coming, and we go, oh, yeah, it's probably just a ship. And then they put in this, and we're all standing there going. <laughs> you learn very quickly to trust your, your animators that they're probably, whatever is on the script, they're going to try and, you know, make real. So we're, we're, so that's a little tricky, but, you know, the live action stuff is what we're mostly responsible for, so that's our job, and, and those guys <laughs> have to make it all look really great afterwards, so. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, I, I did a little bit of CGI stuff, not much, I mean, a little bit with the clones and that, but mostly it was all live action stuff, and uh, I would just be in different positions for different shots, playing a different clone. Um, about to suffer a ball death. Yeah, each yeah. one had their own balls as well. So it was, it was pretty cool. And, and you did the eyes as well, right? That was like, you just light them on fire. Oh, yeah, no, I just lit them. So yeah. it was more painful than... It's funny, somebody, somebody asked me today, so like, you put things in your eyes to make them light up in the show, and I'm like, oh, no. I, how am I supposed to do that while I'm acting? Like, push a button. And how did you, so. do, how did you do that voice? By the way, you want me to do the voice? <laughs> I didn't do the voice. <laughs> Listen, let me tell you. The first of all, for those guys, whoever asked me that question earlier, I'm, only, I'm, I'm joking. But no, people actually think I had stuff in my eyes. I don't know when they're doing that. I don't know when they're what's called flanging my voice. They, in editing, they do it when they feel they need to do it, when he gets angry or whatever. But I have no idea when they're going to be doing it. Just so you know. But it does look cool when they do it. <laughs> You like that, huh? Awesome. Next question. <laughs> Hello. Um, this question is for all of you. Um, you have been now here for th three days. Um, what part of the Comic-Con experience did you enjoy the most? My bed. <laughs> I, I got Billy Piper's autograph. I kissed Ben Browder. <laughs> and I, I, I had a photograph it. with Freddy Krueger, which was, yeah, that was cool. Next question. Hi. Um, from your time on Stargate, who would you say was most like and who was least like their on-screen character? Well, who was most like and least like their on-screen? Uh, I'd say Chris is the least like his on-screen character. <laughs> it's pretty easy. Maybe Amanda is most like her character. Yes, Amanda's most yeah. like her. Well, actually, Rick. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Next. Uh, hi, guys. Um, I was just wondering, what was it like having to learn all the different languages basically from scratch that were created for the Stargate universe? <laughs> Um, it was really easy, because they made that shit up as they went along. <laughs> you know how Star Trek, like, there's actually, like, a Klingon, like, language and stuff that somebody pieced together all the different aspects for it, and they really did painstaking detail to make sure they were consistent with certain things. The only thing that we were consistent with was Cree. That's about it. Everything else, Muzaka Dosa Saka, Bakasa Hakan Kree. 
As long as you ended that shit with Cree, <laughs> you're speaking Goa'u. And no one ever got go ruled right anyway. It changed all the time. Yeah, and, 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 and everybody on every planet spoke damn English anyway, so. <laughs> Next question. Uh, g'day. Uh, a question for Michael. Well, we, get, we were just talking before about Baal deaths. I was just going to uh, ask about Michael deaths. I, I know in, I think it was season five, um, when you got irradiated and everything else and things, it was horrible. Horrible episode, but was that something that was discussed? Was that something that you'd said, Michael, you've, oh, I've had enough, don't want to be an SU1 anymore, I'm off? Or yes. was that part of the whole story? Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yes, I guess. <laughs> That's it? No explanation, Jack. Okay. Yep. Barely succinct, yes, yes. <laughs> Next question. Hi, uh, my question's for Michael and for Cliff. I think it was this two-part series of Stargate where Summit was, ep when they had the Systems Lords meeting. I was just going to ask Cliff, what was it like biting into that symbiote? And um, Michael, what was it like being uh, Yule's um, servant? Well, it was very rubbery. <laughs> Just, we'll get that out the way. Um, yeah. I'd actually, before that, I didn't even know what a symbiote was. I, I really didn't even know. I didn't even know what the gold and the symbiotes was all about. And then the next minute I had to gold. dive in and pull this thing out and bite into it. It was weird, man. It was weird. But yeah, it was that particular one, of course, is made of rubber, but they CGI do everything and make it alive. Uh, it was pretty strange. That's all I really can say about it. Weren't they like like tie wraps or something like that? Didn't they have like like, like some sort of like? They did it. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks for reminding me. At the one point, they gave us like a wrap, like a tie wrap, because I had to bite its head off. So when the time came for me to bite the head off, I had to actually bite this wrap, and <laughs> chew the wrap in the middle of the scene. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. I've completely forgot about yeah. that. So yeah, we had real food on set. I think I was. <laughs> We didn't have a lunch break that day. It was yeah, like, right, no, yeah, let's go, guys. I think the reason I remember is because I was a little jealous because I was hungry at the time. I was like, oh, man, that looks really good. Um, and how was it to be used servant? Did you see that outfit? <laughs> Gold lame pajamas with water wings. You know, you know the worst part about that outfit? Or actually the best part about that outfit, the only thing I can say, is the previous outfit I was supposed to wear... There's another guy in that episode, and he's got this kind of rubber outfit. I think he was background or something like that. He was another one of the servants. It was like rubber hosing going just across his nipples. <laughs> that was my original costume that they had picked out. I'm not, I'm not joking. And I said, are you kidding me? I'm not wearing that. I look like a rent boy. Like... <laughs> so... We upgraded with gold lame pajamas. <laughs> Other than that, it was awesome. Next question. Over here. Oh, here we go. Yes. Um, did you, Michael Shanks, have any um, or how much input did you get to put into your character, Dr. Daniel Jackson, and in like any specific episodes? You know, like, oh, you got, yep. <laughs> I'm not interrupting you. <laughs> no, 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 wait, wait, you, you have to have this. Do you want to make it more specific? No. no? <laughs> I thought maybe I wasn't clear, so I just wanted to be clear. No, I, you were clear. It's just a big tapestry of which to pick something from. Um, it's only a decade of your life. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> uh, well, there, yeah, we were, after the first season of the show, um, uh, we were, you know, once they understood, they understood what direction everything was going in and what direction, you know, what understanding we had of the characters, uh, we started to have a little bit more, a little bit more input, which is more input to sort of say, no, not so much. Like if you saw your character going off in a direction that you kind of disagreed with, 
you would be given permission to address it and have a discussion over that particular thing and then you know either agree or disagree, agree to disagree or whatever it was going to be, however it was settled. So we would have dialogue with them all the time. Uh, oftentimes when it came to things like dialogue, when you were working with Richard Dean Anderson, um, all bets were off because um, Richard, um, he tended to use the script as a guideline you know, it's like the, the uh, expiry date of milk. It's a, it's a suggestion. <laughs> Head kind of in this direction, but, you know, do it at your own discretion. So acting with him, all of a sudden, your script became meaningless. So <laughs> away you go. And um, so we, we kind of had to eventually on set settle on what the lines were actually going to be once he said what he was going to say, and then you had to respond to it, and that didn't work anymore, so say something else. Um, and as time wound on, I th yeah, I think we, we, we did have some input about, you know, certain things, but it was more, we weren't allowed to touch story, but we were allowed to have sort of, you know, voice kind of thing. Like, is this the right voice that's being used? Is this the right, you know, tone of the character? Um, so that was more what our place was. It's, it's, it's a general wash. I wouldn't, I, w I wouldn't say I had any specific. Oh, the only, the only one I had specific input that I can remember vividly was um, when we were doing um, uh, Prometheus Unbound. And... Uh, we had this the fight scene with uh, Daniel and and, um, and Bala that uh, I remember Dan Scher, our fight coordinator, had worked it out where um, uh, they were kind of in this like weird ninja fight where he was kicking her ass and then she was kicking his. And I was like going, I said to Dan after watching the rehearsal, I said, what show have you been on for the last seven years? Because that's not my character. When did he become like a freaking ninja? And he's like, well, no, they just wanted it to be like really kind of like violent. And I sort of said, no, 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 man, we can't do that. This has got to be funny. I said, it's not funny to have a guy punch a girl in the face. It's funnier when he gets kneed in the nuts. It's funnier <laughs> when she kicks his ass, and that's what makes it. And if the minute he's, you know, he's being sympathetic or like, oh, geez, I'm so sorry, I did that. That's when she really kicks his ass, and that's, the, you know, the tone that. I kind of grabbed hold of that, and that's why we reblocked the fight to make it a little bit more comedic than serious, because it was a, kind of a serious fight where it was just didn't make a lot of sense for for our characters anyway, for my character. So, next, <laughs> hi guys. Uh, I was just curious in regards to interaction after takes and in between shots. Was there ever a time when one of the gold stayed in character a little bit too long and perhaps turned to one of you guys and said? Something along the lines of, uh, I'm a god, get me a beer, or something like that. A anything like that. Anything yeah, you can think of. Yeah, I used to say that to Richard every lunch break. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely wouldn't have been around for five seasons. <laughs> no, no, no. The, the character stays in the studio for me. No, no, nobody did that. No. I did try that with a man, with Amanda, and she she punched me. If you remember, <laughs> bow before your God. Bow. <laughs> Next question. Uh, this is for all of you. Um, do you like the spin-off Stargate Universe? <laughs> I'd like to take the fifth on that, please. I l I like what they did with it visually. I, I think they were, you know, we're moving into an interesting visual thing with it. I didn't watch enough of the series to know whether I liked it or not. I, I liked, I liked what they were doing, you know, camera-wise, visually with the show. Um, <clears throat> but one of the great things about SG One, which is what I loved when I watched it and what I enjoyed when I was on the show, is that you love the characters. You love O'Neill. You love Carter. You love Tilk. You love Daniel Jackson. You're okay with Mitchell. You know. <laughs> But that, that was the, the great strength of it was that there was, you know, you had, you had people that you wanted to go with. And, and I think that, you know, they were, as they were reaching for a darker edge, I think it was difficult for the Stargate audience to, to go that direction for the traditional Stargate audience. So it was a risk. I appreciate what they did visually. But, you know, I, I think that SG-1 had um, a very special quality about it, which, you know, is in, in large part due to you know, Mike and Amanda and Chris and, and Rick establishing that, that show in a way that the audience wants to go through the gate every week with, with those people. And I'm not sure that um, it was a, 
a great transition for the traditional, you know, for, for the traditional Stargate audience. That's not to say that it wasn't an admirable attempt, but I think it was, it, you know, I think it was hard for the audience. Um, nice. Said it all. Uh, the, the only thing I can, I, I can add to that, I agree with everything Ben said, is that one of the th mistakes I think that they made, which is, you know, it's hard to call it a mistake so much as a mistake of timing, is it was too soon. I think the success of Battlestar using that tone was a hard act to follow. And I think using the Stargate brand with Atlantis just freshly gone and SG-1 just you know, freshly gone as well, to then introduce that same audience to a completely different tone was a bit too soon for them to want to feel a revival of some kind on some other level. And I think if you probably tried it, say, now and started it, you might have an audience be more willing to accept it. And you disagree. That's, that's okay. I mean, that's because uh, th there is a certain expectation that comes with the Stargate name that there's a certain tone associated with it. And if it, you know, if, if you disagree with that, then you're not going to be. If, if, if you name the show something different, then it might be. If, you did, if it wasn't a Stargate vehicle, you might accept it as being that tone without it, the expectation of something else. So, um, I, But I, I agree with Ben. I think that Watching it, watching the, the attempts that they were making, the visuals were stunning. They were way better than they ever were on, on SG-1. Yeah. And, um, and I envied some of the, um, the actors for some of the scenes they were having. I did an episode with Robert Carlyle called Human. And I think Robert's an extraordinary actor to work with. He, and he you know, won an, uh, a, a Canadian a Screen Award for that particular performance and deserved every inch of it because he elevated every you know, piece of material he got. And he made you feel like you were doing something that was up here. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I think that uh, a lot of the other characters and cast failed to meet that same sort of requirement that he, he brought it to. So, Next question. Hello. <laughs> I think you're all awesome. Um, I wanted to bring up um, Claudia Black's character because I think she's kick-ass. She was one of the really great kick-ass females on the show. Um, I wanted to know, this is to all of you, what if you've got a favourite scene or favourite episode that you had with her because she really created a really good dynamic on the show. That's what I felt. Anyway. I'll start with this. Because um, <clears throat> I've worked with Claudia a little bit. First off, as I, as I said in my thing, I, you know, Claudia is a tremendous actress with an amazing range. She has great versatility. What she did on Stargate is 180 degrees different from what she did on Farscape and completely realized. I, I had, uh, you know, in my seasons on Stargate, I think one scene with Claudia Black, <laughs> and they cut it. <laughs> No, I mean, seriously, we, we had a scene, and, and they, we were in a, a two-hander together, and they went, uh, no, 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 they're just, just they, she belongs to Daniel Jackson. <laughs> no, but you, you, you had that great scene with her in, in Quest where you took her aside and told her. Yeah, no, that, well, that was, had, that was. You also yeah. had that one, that, that, all that stuff in Bounty, which was really cool. Yeah, that's true. Because these guys have great, these two had great chemistry together, you know, um, regardless, regardless of their characters that they were playing, so... Uh, yeah, no, she's, I mean, she's just so tremendous to work with. You know, someone needs to, you know, lasso her, bring her back to Australia, and put her back on your screens here in Australia. So, um, yeah, no, she, she's, she's an amazing actress. By the way, for all you Vampire Diary fans and watch the spin-off The Originals with Daniel Gillies on it, she will be in a recurring role on that. So look forward to that. Yeah. So what was, what was your, I, I have my, my, my least favorite scene with you and her. She's in the red underwear. Right. You come into the scene and she wants to shag you rotten. Right. And you say no. <laughs> Did you discuss with the writers in that instance how gay that made you? Because I immediately saw the scene and I went to the writers and said, Mitchell will go. <laughs> Mitchell will take the mission right now. See, that's, that's the thing with you coming in late to the franchise is you're assuming that's the first time Daniel appeared gay. 
Oh, no, because I saw all eight seasons before I came on the show. I just thought, you know, here's a perfect opportunity for you. Well, I, I think what you witnessed was the peak of gayness. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it was probably my least favorite scene, too. And I did discuss, I think as soon as we, we yelled cut, I was just like, sure, yeah, right. <laughs> That's when I went out. Yeah, that happened. Yeah. <laughs> Total break from reality there, bro. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> Something about your favorite scene with Vala. Oh, right. Uh, oh, favorite scene, favorite scene with Vala. Uh, Ah, shit, all of them. You know, I just enjoyed the hell out of working with Claudia. From the, I mean, listen, she was written as a one-episode character. And, you know, uh, they wanted her back uh, for all of season nine. There, our producers did, and uh, the network was reluctant because Ben was coming on the show to put the two of them together at the same time. And after we shot the first six episodes, five, six episodes of the ninth season... All the people at Sci-Fi that were going, I don't know, I don't know. We're all going, yeah, we made a mistake. We should have done that. And that's why she came on full bore in the in the tenth season was because everybody now was going, yeah, we need to make that happen right now. So she's she's pretty awesome to uh, to work with all the time. Yeah. Next question. Actually, Cliffy didn't answer that. Cliff, you, you, oh, yeah, you worked you with her, yeah. You had seen the Claude. You said it all. <laughs> No, actually, I, I had a great scene with her in the one episode where she slapped me across the face and I was trying to kiss her when I was a prisoner in whatever episode it was, if you remember that. That was great. I mean, she is. I mean, just to say what they... She's a phenomenal girl. Um, and, you know, working with her in Continuum, I didn't get to work with her as much as these guys, of course, but when I did, yeah, phenomenal actress. Loved her. Loved her. And she used to rip me off about being South African the whole time. <laughs> Hi guys, welcome to Perth. I wanted to ask about what is the worst prank you've pulled on someone uh, on set or the worst prank that's been pulled on you? I told the cookie dough story the other day. The, the yeah, that was good. That was Chris good. rolled up the cookie dough, put it in your toilet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wasn't that bad. It was tasty. <laughs> It wasn't cookie dough. <laughs> now you tell me. <laughs> you told me it, it was, was cookie dough, it man. Was, it was hard to tell you when you were sitting there doing this. <laughs> that would be the worst prank ever. Yeah. <laughs> I told the story yesterday. Anybody at my talk yesterday? Yeah, no, it, my, my introduction to the show, first episode I'm in, and I'm Chris Judge. It's obviously Chris Judge. I never pulled any pranks, but Judge was a regular at that. And the ceiling's coming down. We're in an enclosed space. We're trying to solve a puzzle, yada, yada, yada. And I'm, I look over in there. Hey, hey, guys, we can hear you have the mic. What are we getting for lunch? <laughs> no, it wasn't before. No, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, and the ceiling's coming down. It's getting smaller and smaller. I'm in, enclosed in a space with a 230-pound black man, and he starts pulling his trousers off. <laughs> Chris had a fetish for exposing parts of his body to the camera. But at the time, I was a little concerned. <laughs> I, thought, I thought, here's my introduction to the gate, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so... There's nothing more disconcerting when the roof is coming down, you're not sure of your safety, and the only escape hatch has that staring you in the face. <laughs> you must have some. Well, he, n he never really did anything to me, uh, like, like, directly. Like, he, I mean, he, he's boasted over a few things, and I have no idea what the hell he's talking about. Yeah. Um, uh, were, you the the day, my, uh, were you there the day? the day pulled the one on Amanda though? Which one? The final episode. Oh, the tearaway pants. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, that was awesome. I, I, if you really might, in my panel yesterday heard this one as well. But it's the final scene. Amanda's doing this incredible crying scene. We're all aging on the ship. It was the last episode of the regular series, and and she com she comes out and she's coming down the hall crying because Landry has died, and 
and she's acting her heart out, and she's going to get comforted by Teal'c. And the door opens, and there stands Chris Judge <clears throat> in a thong. <laughs> Not an Australian thong, a thong, you know, for his banana sling. His banana sling with a rhinestone SG-1 on it. <laughs> I thought that was pretty epic. One of the few ones, I told, told the, the pudding one yesterday, but one of the other ones, which was actually all the way back in the first season, of the second season? Oh, God damn. <laughs> second season of the show was when we were filming 1969. Um, we were filming it. That's now, like the second season. Second season. Yeah, that, that's when Mitchell was born. <laughs> I know this because that's when Mitchell oh, was right, born. Right. Because right. yeah, right, okay. O'Neill's his daddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't read the script? It was there. <laughs> anyway, when I was fighting the Peacekeeper Wars and... You did a great job in that, by Thank the way. Thank you very you much. excellent. What was Bala's name then? What was it? Aaron, it was Aaron. Aaron's son was pregnant. Aaron Soon, yeah. And this Muppet was on my shoulder talking about some shit. You know it's an Australian show, right? Don't fuck with the Aussies, bro. <laughs> Is, is there an Australian translation for Muppet? <laughs> Moving right along. Next um, question. <laughs> oh, yeah, so 1969. Um, uh, Chris Judge is born and bred in L.A. He's deathly afraid of anything that um, doesn't drive or walk on two legs. So if it's a beetle, a squirrel, a rabid cat, or a bear, especially a bear, he's a big man, but he is the biggest sissy in the entire world. So we're filming up on this, um, on uh, Capilano Mountain Road, uh, the scene where we're flagging down the bus that eventually picks SG-1 up. And um, so we're all waiting because they're, um, they're sort of, making a sort of walkway for us to walk up to the road to hail down the bus or whatever. And, and uh, so the guys are, are digging it out. And we're all sort of standing around in the cold, sort of waiting. And I see uh, this guy, Crispy Barrett, who is one of our, our um, uh, construction guys. And he's a bear of a man. And he's wearing all black. And he's got this big-ass beard. And he's in the ditch digging away. And all you see coming up, popping up above, is this guy in the back of his head and some beard sticking out in this black T-shirt. And he's digging the ditch. So I said to I'm standing there with Chris, and I go, shh, you hear that? <laughs> He's like, what the fuck, what, 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 what are we talking about, man? I'm like, no, no, I just heard something. He goes, stop fucking around, stop fucking around, stop fucking around. <laughs> and I go, holy shit, and I point over there, and just as timing would have it, that's just when Crispy stood up, <laughs> and Chris Judge goes running. like Jesse Owens <laughs> down the mountainside, down the road, and we all start howling, laughing, because he's dead serious. And he gets about 30 feet up, and we're laughing, and he looks up and he sees, and Crispy sort of standing there with his shovel going, what the hell's going on? And then he starts running back. <laughs> and now I'm running up the hill. <laughs> they, they made the mistake once about... Uh, Two seasons later, they made the mistake once we were filming in the same, you know, in the GVRD, which is uh, the Greater Vancouver Reservoir District, where, um, uh, where a lot of our forest stuff early on was shot. They made the mistake of saying on the radios uh, that a black bear had been spotted um, somewhere near um, main camp. And <laughs> Chris did not come out of his trailer for about four hours. <laughs> Dead serious. Anyway. Next question. Hi, guys. It's brilliant to see you guys in the path. But um, I was wondering, um, what was your first day of uh, shooting was like, and especially for Michael, the uh, pilot? Uh, the first day of shooting the pilot was a complete and utter disaster. 
Um, the very first sequence we were shooting was, um, wow, this is going way back, uh, was where we just break, broken out of the prison with all the um, slaves, whatever, the chosen sacrifice, whatever those people were called. And so, we're, so SG-1 is just, Teal's just blown through the, the thing and, and we're running out. Now all that stuff in the prison was in the studio. And so outside, we're running down a mountainside. So they set up this sort of you know, wall with this sort of castle wall that we've run out of. And that's our first day. And then we're going to have some scenes on the mountainside talking about what we've got to do next and all this other stuff. Anyway, they knew we were in a time crunch. And uh, so they wanted to shoot French hours, which means there's no lunch. You just carry on and we'll be sort of eat snacking throughout the day. And it poured absolute frickin' rain all day from sunup to sundown. And I don't mean rain, I mean it poured. And by the time that day was done, it, everybody, because you couldn't, the problem with rain in that sense is, it, first of all, it doesn't read unless it's like, that's why they use rain towers uh, in film, is because water, just like light water, raindrops, does not read on camera. All everything looks is just wet. So you can't actually see the rain falling. So uh, we're all soaked, and it, now our continuity doesn't match because you'll be starting the scene like you just came out of the thing, but you're already soaked because you've been standing out in this horrific rainstorm all day. So the extras are soaked. Everybody's wardrobe is soaked. Anyway, this went on. We, we've shot the day. They took the film in to process it, and we all, I mean, everybody was catching cold. This is the very first day of filming. We thought it was like, you know, a disaster movie we were making. And... Um, the, the film was ruined as well from the cameras. We were still using 35 millimeter film at the time and the film was ruined from the cameras. Not all of it, but a lot of glaring sections had huge damage to it. So they actually had to take all of the first day's work, the entire first day, and throw it in the garbage. We had to reshoot it all a different day. So that was our first day of shooting the pilot. Didn't feel like it boded very well. Uh, my first day at Summit, I think, was the first episode that I came in on. There, that come, it was kind of like an audition scene for the new system laws, who they're going to get in and who they're not. And um, It was great. I enjoyed it. I mean, I, I, I kind of just looked around at what the guys were doing. I knew I wasn't going to play this guy as a bad guy. You know, you just let the dialogue do it for you. I was going to play him as a good guy and uh, a guy who looks at women, which he did. Osiris walked in, of course. I slouched down in my chair and... You know, crossed my legs over and I smiled and I looked up and down. And that kind of set what the character was going to be. Uh, I had a lot of fun with it that first day. It was really cool. And I remember Martin Wood was directing that episode. And, uh, you know, he came out after, afterwards and he was like, oh, no, don't worry, you're going to be back. You're going to be back and all that kind of stuff, you know. Because you're under a lot of pressure. When you come in as a guest star on a show, you don't know anyone. You want to do the, you want to, you want to be good the first day. Um, and it's, it's nerve-wracking. There's a lot of anxiety to it because you don't want to cock up. I mean, these guys are all working hard every day, and you come in as a guest star, you want to get it done. So uh, it was exciting. It was great. And then Michael Greenberg came, up, came to me afterwards and said that was great. So uh, it was nice. But I never knew. For me, from episode to episode, I never knew that I was coming back. A lot of people have asked, like, you know, do you, did you have a 10-episode deal and all this kind of stuff? No. It was episode to episode, so I never knew. Every time I finished that episode and I said goodbye to these guys, I thought that's actually the last time that I'd see them. Really. So it's, uh, it's crazy. Crazy. But I enjoyed the first day. It was fantastic. And here you are. <laughs> yeah, here I am. What, like 15 years later, sitting on a stage talking he about... He won't go game. away. <laughs> Until he has a ball death. <laughs> or another one. <laughs> I'm like a bad cold. I was like, fuck, I just don't go. Uh, yeah, my, my first day was, um, it was mostly with Chris Judge. <laughs> but the weird thing was is that it's a scene, and, and Tilk was doing all the talking. <laughs> so I was like, man, you got a lot of exposition in this show, which I knew was, was a, break, a break from any reality of the show I'd ever seen. I mean, for, for eight seasons, all he'd said was, indeed. And suddenly I'm like, well, so this is the new show. Tilk does all the exposition. <laughs> he went and bitterly complained about his day of work. Um, <clears throat> no, no, it was fine, but it was nothing, nothing too eventful. I was just happy to, to get through the day without, you know, some rabid um, Richard Dean Anderson fan showing up a set and shooting me for a deer rifle. So. 
<laughs> I was treading very carefully for a while there. Next question. Um, this is mainly based on your character in Saving Hope, Michael. But is it ever hard to, like, have someone talking to you and you can see it, but you can't reply? Um, <sighs> that happens at home all the time, yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> not really. Like, the thing about it is, is I worked with Ben for a couple of years. So Ben can talk a dog off a chuck wagon. Let's, 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 and, no, I'm just kidding. Not on screen. <laughs> well, no, he can, but that's not the point. Um, uh, it, it is, it's one of those, it's one of those, the funny thing about it is I thought it would be a lot harder than it was um, uh, in the second season because all of a sudden, you know, Charlie can, he's, he's doing his job and he's also, the ghosts are talking to him. And so I thought it would be a lot more difficult, but the funny thing about the acceptance by the audience, because we don't do any visual tricks or anything like that, it's just like another person is there. So sometimes it's actually Charlie looking around or saying, whispering to somebody that, you know, that's whispering to the ghost that reminds you that this is not a person that's asking for help. So I thought it'd be a little bit difficult to sell it than it was. It was fun at first because it's kind of like um, I used it as the, um, one of the great things about the way Rick portrayed O'Neill was he was this character who was <laughs> reluctant to believe in science fiction. And that's what was actually charming where at first we were sitting there going like, you know, like, Patrick Stewart, well, he, he's, he's, he, he wants, he relishes the fight, and he understands all the exposition, and he's very passionate about the world he lives in, where Rick is like, what? Who, what? You know, he doesn't care, or it's like, I can't be bothered with this, or whatever. Ball, ball, bocce, bocce ball. So, you know, he's always mo almost mocking the concepts that we're inventing, and one of the, the things I sort of gleaned from that about its effectiveness is it's, it's kind of like a reluctant protagonist. He doesn't... The, the charm of that is he doesn't want to be part of the world he's like been thrust into leadership of. And there's a charm to that. And it's something I actually sort of grasped when I was faced with the dilemma in Saving Hope. I sort of went, well, it doesn't, it's boring if the character wants to, embraces accepting this thing. How about from the get-go, he just actually, he doesn't, he's, he's actually in disbelief of it and doesn't want to believe this shit is happening and actually wants it to go away. And they kind of cued off of that, and that's what's led into the, the, the arc. So that, uh, for me, to answer your original question, uh, it was more, like I said, once you watch it, you sort of accept because the person is just there, and the audience is seeing them there, that it's just a conversation, and you forget sometimes that it's supposed to be a ghost talking to them. Next question. Yeah, hi. Um, I enjoyed the show right through to the end of um, Atlantis. Uh, two questions. First, during the show you used P90s as weapons, but you never used the Zats. And the second one is, what are your thoughts on the new sequel to the original Stargate movie? You, you, you're saying that we didn't use the Zats? Well, you didn't use it constantly. As no, in, you, you you relied more on the P90s than the Zats, but the no. Zats seem more practical. I refuse to carry a Zat. I will say this: I because they actually put it as a sidearm for us at certain points, um, and I refused to because I thought it was the dumbest weapon ever invented by sci-fi. <laughs> First of all, and you have to understand this: you only see it when it's like you know shooting out of CGI rays and stuff like that. If you see it in reality as you see some of the people walking around with the replicas, it's a penis. <laughs> and the practical, the practical effect of this was where you'd squeeze the trigger and the little thing would go, <laughs> And you probably never even noticed it. Like, it was such a small, subtle effect. You probably never even noticed it. We could have just shaken the damn thing and we, nobody ever got close to watch it go, Peek. So the idea of brandishing a penis at the aliens <laughs> was not at all appealing to me in the least. And the second part, and I have to say this, and this is why it's the dumbest weapon, one-shot stuns, <laughs> two kills, three makes it disappear. Now... After you've been stunned, and an hour later you go swimming, 
and they shoot you one more time. Are you stunned again? Or are you been dead? Because the, and after you get stunned three times, shouldn't you disappear? <laughs> What's the delay on that one? I wasn't sure. Because the reason why, and I, I, will, I will have to say this, because none of us were terribly fond of the original concept, the reason why the weapon had this magical ability was because in the episode of which it was discovered, which was the uh, cliffhanger for season one, we were knocking out all these guards on this um, spaceship and, and, you know, all the bodies were lying around, so the Somebody, I guess, addressed it with saying, well, isn't somebody going to discover these bodies? And the guy went, oh, well, yeah, three shots makes it disappear. <laughs> that was the director, right? Yeah, and it was like sometimes the Zat could do whatever it wanted. Like in 1969, O'Neill shoots a padlock, and a padlock, like, disappears or whatever it is or breaks open, and you're like, when can the Zat do that? Shouldn't the, shouldn't the padlock be just stunned? I agree with everything he said. <laughs> I, I, I always fought against carrying the Zat whenever I could for all of the above reasons. I just, I was like, no, Mitchell's more, he's definitely more military. He's got his, he's got his, he's got his nine mil. Yeah. Plus, there's another thing about carrying the practical weapons. We, we did live fire stuff, right? So we'd be in a firefight, right? It's a lot of fun to be out there with automatic weapons firing off live fire. There's, you know, gunfire is fun for an actor, right? If you're standing there and someone else has, you know, got, and I like the G36, you got a G36, reload the clip, just unload it into the woods, and you're stuck there with a zat going. <laughs> it's not as much fun. Oh, there's a, there's, I forgot about this. There's another part about it, too. Uh, Oh, but here's one thing that I really didn't get. I couldn't understand why every village we went into, we went in carrying armed weapons. And the villagers are like, what can we do for you? <laughs> it's like if we rolled, up, we rolled up into Perth carrying a G36 and some P90s, you know, people, are, they're going to call the cops. We roll into the town and like, we're so happy to see you. I am Oman. Welcome to my village. This, this but I guess it could be completely different if we walk up and we're carrying the Zats. They're like, yeah, the uh, red yeah. light district is over yeah. there, fellas. There was, there was an episode. Uh, Give us your whores. <laughs> the, other thing, the other thing, too, is you, because there was no effect, like with the, with the, the handguns and, the, and, the, and the, all of our automatic weapons, you knew when it was firing because it would fire a blank. Or it would, you know, at least even in the case of some of the handguns, it would like at least discharge a gas round or something like that, and they'd put the effect in afterwards if it was in close range. With the Zats, you weren't entirely sure that the CGI guys were going to be able to tell when you thought you were firing the weapon. <laughs> and if you watch, there's one scene in, um, I think it's Fallen, where Corin Nemec and I, um, uh, Jonas uh, and Daniel, uh, get ringed into this room. And <laughs> this is actually, you have to rewatch this if you haven't seen it already. This is kind of hilarious. Is that we get ringed into the room, and there's a bunch of guards all lying around, and... Um, uh, we, start, we start firing the Zats. <laughs> and if you watch carefully, that poor Corin is still doing this <laughs> when they stop using the effect. <laughs> so he does at least two more. <laughs> and they're not helping him. Never piss off the CG gods. Oh, boy. Okay. I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, that that's all we have time for. Aww. Please give a big round of applause for Cliff, Ben, and Michael. Thank you, guys. Thanks for all the support over the years. i got to tell you that. Thank you. Thanks, guys.